used Beer's lab before, and basically in this lab, it was um, its role was to act as a translator for when we um, collected data that has to do with absorbance um, over a set amount of time, and we could use the the concentration. We could use the trend line equation that the Beer's law plot gives us to convert those absorption values to concentration, which I'll re-explain later. Um, but that was the first use of the spectrophotometer. And second of all, like I just said, it was then kind of used, you know, with the integrated and the pseudo ray law. Um, a technique that we used was <clears throat> serial dilutions, um, which I will talk about more later. So the Beer's Law plot data and kind of the components that went into it. So first of all, we selected 630 nanometers as our wavelength. Um, in a previous lab, we had a copper nitrate solution that was a deep blue, and we figured that this would be a good way to go. Um, whichever we, whatever uh, value we chose, we knew that it had to be um, closer to the 700 nanometer side of the spectrum. Uh, because that those colors um, are opposing, those colors oppose like the blues and the the violets, and that would allow for optimum, for an optimum uh, absorption. So we began with 24.9 micromolars of crystal violet, um, and here's where the serial dilution came in. We basically diluted it to um, to a half, a fourth, an eighth, and a sixteenth. So we didn't know those exact concentrations, which is where the Beer's Law plot that we graphed comes into play. But basically, with those dilutions, we um, used them in the spectrophotometer, the cuvettes, and we um, recorded the accompanying absorbance values. And they did decrease as they were supposed to. Um, our Beer's Law absorbance versus molarity plot looked like this, as you can see that the trend line equation it gave us here gives you an x, which is um, what you what you use as the molarity that you can solve for, and then becomes vital as um, the translator for the further parts of the lab. Okay, so some key concepts here: um, rate law, so integrated rate law, and the pseudo rate law. So the integrated rate law is basically um, a way to describe the concentration of a reactant as a function of time. You know, in class we study zero order reactions, first order and second order reactions, um, and all three of those have um, separate math equations and graphs that you can um, plot and observe, you know, from the data that you collect. Um, so we have our graphs here. So this would be the graph for the ln concentration of CV versus time, or in other words, the first order reaction graph, um, the second order reaction graph, one over concentration, and then a zero order concentration versus time. So basically what we're looking for here was the graph that gave us the most linear relationship which, as you can see, happened to be the ln of concentration. And so basically, that is how we figured out that crystal violet was a first order reaction. Um, so after we figured that out, well, actually, sorry, before we figured that out, to get to that point, we had um, a set of, we recorded um, absorbance values over over four minutes in 30 second intervals. We had six milliliters of crystal violet and four milliliters of NaOH. So this is at the point where we, we're reacting, we're doing the reaction, we're performing the reaction, and that's when we had all these values here. It gave us a certain absorbance which we were able to plug in to the, um, the Beer's Law plot and use that um, relationship to find our concentration values, which is then how we, and then we were able to use that with the integrated rate laws.
and it all kind of came together and that's when we plotted and we figured out that this would be a first order for the crystal violet. So once we got to that point is when we were then able to bring in the idea of um, a pseudo rate law. So basically for this lab, um, another really key I, uh, factor was that the concentration that we had for the sodium hydroxide was was much, much larger than the concentration for um, the crystal violet. I mean, that's 24 micromolar compared to two molars. That's a huge difference. So because it's so large, it's we could, the pseudo rate law uh, is, utilizes that uh, information and almost accounts that hydroxide as negligible, right? So we changed the regular rate law to um, K prime of the concentration of CV raised to the N, where K prime equals the, the concentration of hydroxide raised to the M. Okay, so this is when we're able to change the concentration of um, the sodium hydroxide, and we cut we cut it in half, or we change the the volume, and we knew that if we kept the CV CV constant, whatever change we observed in the rate had to have come from the sodium hydroxide. So, and at this point, for our trial, our second and third trials, we didn't have to um, graph the other two graphs because we knew already that it was going to be a first order. The CV was first order. It's not going to change just because we have, you know, more trials. So basically, after we plotted all the points and repeated those steps and for our trial, our second and third trials, we ended up figuring out, well, the right law that our data provided us with was um, the rate equals K of hydroxide raised to the one half or CV to the one. So CV is a first order reaction, which basically means that um, if if the uh, concentration were to double, the rate would also double. So it's like a one to one kind of relationship. Um, the sodium hydroxide, on the other hand, came out to being a half order reaction. And then when we solved for K, we got 0.006044. So just a quick uh, point about how we got those values, um, not to talk about content, uh, calculations, but basically we were able to use the K primes for both our, our trial one and trial two, which is what we used. And with some math and whatnot, we figured out that N equals this value here, and then we rounded it to 0.5, which is how we figured that out. And then the rate constant, we, we um, played with the K prime equation, K prime equals K of the concentration of OH. That's the equation we used for that, which is what allowed us to figure out what K was, and then leave us with the complete rate law. Um, so some errors in this lab. Uh, for one, a bit of a limitation is that crystal violet actually stains cuvettes, and the issue here is that, well, that would um, factor into the absorbance, absorbance values that were recorded because if there's smudges and things or stains on cuvettes that are incredibly sensitive, that's going to get in the way of the absorbance. It's going to give us a higher absorbance value. And it's not true. You know, it's it's not the solutions. Not, not what is absorbing the light. It's that the smudges, the imperfections of the cuvette. Um, so higher absorbance values would directly affect the linearity of our graphs and would also provide concentration values that would be too high because that relationship is uh, direct and linear. Um, other errors that were a little bit more on the human side. Um, so we chose 630 nanometers as our wavelength. And, you know, in hindsight, after, you know, the, you know, for the post lab, you know, as I was researching, I did find that um, an ideal wavelength was actually 590. But having said that, it's a not that large of a difference, so um, it shouldn't have affected our data too badly. Um, but you'll see, I will explain in a little bit why I'm considering that as an error. Uh, a third error procedurally, again, was um, the process of uh, reacting the two reactants and placing it in the SPEC-20 and shutting it and recording that first um, initial constant, the initial absorbance value, 
and at the same time being able to time it, all of that together was a bit complex and there's a lot of confusion sometimes. As you can see, we did end up doing three trials because there was some error there as well. So just procedurally having and having to keep that same speed, there's some room for error there in our consistency. That might have affected um, graphs, linearity, um, that could carry through to absorbance and our k value and such. So continuing with the errors, so like I said, further research shows that the rate law for this reaction is actually first order for both reactants. And overall, the reaction has an order of two. Our data, however, as, um, as you saw, portrays that the order of the, the hydroxide came out to be a half. So there was definitely some error there. Um, pinpointing exactly where that error is um, is a bit difficult. But it could have been because of the wavelength or the stained cuvettes that wouldn't have allowed us to record, you know, those exact, not exact, but more accurate absorbances. So as an extension, um, so yeah, obviously for this lab, the the color was a big um, had a had a driving role in what methods we chose to use. Um, obviously, not every reaction has that advantage. So other methods, you know, must be used to derive the rate laws for those reactions. So if we're talking about a reaction where a gas is produced, um, we could uh, en en envision a scenario where we had an evacuated container with a bar barometer connected to it, which um, is a device that measures pressure. And then we could proceed to start the reaction. So. Um, the goal here would be to monitor the container to see how the pressure would increase or decrease as the reaction took place. Um, and then in that kind of scenario, we'd be dealing with Kp and partial pressures of the gases. See, because here we don't have that advantage of light and we have gases, you know, fluttering around in a container. So looking at pressure as opposed to, you know, this relationship between absorbance and concentration makes more sense.